Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with the Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week. It's Friday, March 8th. There it is, Friday, March 8th. Thanks so much for joining me. Let's see, uh, who we got in the house? We got Manny uh, doing some test cooking accompanied by Poetry Critique. <laughs> Could this be some kind of heaven? And uh, Katie Dozier is here too, who is also cooking a shepherd's pie downstairs. Uh, two floors below me. Uh, James Langford is here. Uh, Monica Dobos, uh, D. Coleman. Uh, Dick Westheimer is here. Cindy Gunterman. Uh, Sharon Ferrante. Fady. Uh, Monica Dobos. Again, I already said that. Emily Arnold Fernandez. Uh, Tom Barlow is here. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading some comments. Mary Keating is here. Clayton Clark. Lisa Seidenberg. Nate Jacob. Uh, Morgan Feeney, Joe Bark is here. Hey, Joe. Uh, Jamie Thomas is here. Yeah, so we got a great group. Another poet as well. Great group of people always over on Facebook. We got Jenny Middleton, Tara Mazalik McMahon. And actually, I should say too, the whole problem with uh, Facebook not allowing our, um, our, our music in the background, um, they, they dropped their copyright thing when I pointed out that it was a public domain song. Um, but anyway, so we're free to run on facebook as well now as always the point of the critique is to give that workshop experience which is so fun and valuable to poets you know to letting people actually know who kind of know and love poetry what works and what doesn't in your poems it's something that's really difficult feedback to get so um it's very helpful if you can leave as many comments as you can as we go through these poems in the chat windows i'll pass them as many along as i can as we go but also um the poets are here and can read um the comments too so anything you can help that gives your interpretation, opinion of the poem, what works, what doesn't, what might improve it. Leave as many comments as you can. We're all trying to get better here, and that's the goal. Now, we're going to start out this week talking about uh, Sestinas a little bit, because um, if you probably know that the prompt poem of the week this week is to write a Sestina, um, and not only a Sestina, but a golden Sestina, we called it, which is you take a quote um, from some other poem, like you would for a golden shovel. And in a golden shovel, it would be the last, um, the N-words would all write out that line from the poem. And this is going to be a golden sestina, where we take the quote and then take six words from that quote to be the N-words of the sestina. And the sestina is kind of, I've said it many times, kind of famously, it's my least favorite form, I think, because the poems do tend to go on a long time, and they don't have as much music. A lot of times people write them in um, syllabics, and I, I'm a meter kind of person. I like the stress counts rather than uh, syllabics. And, um, but I don't know, but, but we have published some great ones in the past, and uh, I was going to show one on the screen here and just take a look at how the Sestina works so you get to know it just if, you, if it, you're unfamiliar with what a Sestina is. So here's a little primer on the Sestina. This is a, probably the most successful Sestina we published. Um, we did do Kim Edenizio has a Sestina um, on writing, I think it's called. Um, is that what it's called? Maybe. Uh, you can find that if you look up, type Kim Adonizio into the search bar at rattle.com. But, um, but that only has the same word as the end word. So it's sort of a, a push. It's a mono word, Sestina. But most Sestina, Sestina is, you know, start because there's six. And so what you do here, um, you'll see in this poem, um, Rebecca Snow has these words at the end of each line. Adjunct, bathtub, fate, our, keep, and neighbors. In every stanza, there's six stanzas that follow that all have those as the last words, all right? And uh, as we go down through, and then the very last, the seventh stanza, is only three lines and buries those words somewhere within. So you still have those three words. The adjunct is here. Um, some are going to find taking a bath for the bathtub. Um, fate was one of them. Yeah, fate was one of them. And so, so that's how it works. So... Um, and then there's a rhyme, there's a scheme, there's sort of a pattern. I think I've seen Sestinas that don't do this. Uh, you don't really have to, but a traditional classic Sestina hitting all the marks would have um, this pattern too to the end words. So we have the, so this is like one, two, three, four, five, six, right? There's six words here. And it's kind of a complicated pattern, but we take the neighbors, we take the last line, becomes the first line. Then the first line becomes the second line. Then the um, <laughs> then the, uh, the, what is it? The fifth line becomes a third line. And then the third line becomes the fourth line. So we pull or second line becomes the fourth line. So we kind of go back and forth. It's like you do bam, then that, then that, then that kind of bouncing back until you land on fate, which this poem should fate. See, and we do the same thing for the next stanza. So, you know, fate ends this one. So fate repeats there. We kind of go back and forth, faded neighbors, our adjunct bathtub keeping, 
and end on keeping. See how that works? Keeping. Then keeping becomes the first word. Then we bounce back and forth. Keeping. Fates. Bathtub. Neighborly. Adjuncts. R. And we end up on R. You see how that, that works? And so what you get when you write this form is this kind of, and maybe the, the reason why it doesn't really work for me, it's difficult for me to write them, is I have a more lyrical, condensed type of poetry that I tend to write. And this is great for, I always think of the, the peak of sort of maximalist, like energy kind of spunky poetry as Denise Duhamel. And I'm sure she writes the scenes all the time. I can't think of one offhand. But but there, when you like want to pack in a lot of stuff, and then you have this like sort of faint in the background kind of echo coming up with sort of callbacks to the poems or, or to the, the previous. And so you kind of keep hearing these same words over and over again, but it's a really subtle effect. And it works great for this poems with a lot of stuff in it. And so that's what we have in the Cassistina form. Let's, uh, let's sit back for three minutes, though, and let uh, Rebecca read this poem for you just to get in and listen to listen to when you hear those echoes of the words and this is what we do with the form and it is a good way to if you're going to have um that kind of maximalist style with a lot of substance and a lot of things going on a lot of a lot of items a lot of movement a lot of you know stuff in the poem it's one of those things Um, it's a great way to sort of keep it within some kind of form and to me that's the way that the way that that echo comes through of all these words. So listen to this as we go with uh, Rebecca Snow's Sestina for Adjuncts. Maybe I'll pause it to highlight a couple things as we go too, but here we go. Sestina for Adjuncts. Caring is all about shit, the lady in the van. All those articles on the nationwide plight of adjunct faculty fail to mention sewage backing up in the bathtub, a slumlord using the rotor rooter man to manage another teacher's fate. Replacing the pipeline costs over ten grand. We should just put all our used toilet paper in plastic bags, lay traps for the mice, keep the leaky gas stove unplugged, wear earplugs against the neighbors in the living room, not physical bodies but voices of neighbors arguing for the perpetual loss of peace, conversations adjunct adjacent, rising in noxious waves from the apartment below, keeping fingernail on the chalkboard time with grating papers, the bathtub devoid of candles and Epsom salts because we associate our state of mind with slaves and victims of domestic violence, fated to bless the salaries of university presidents and higher admin fates in offices with views of all those roofs devoted to smart screens, neighborly online tutorials that teach the students to use a comma splice as if our semicolon has lost its head. Students aren't oblivious. They see adjuncts without offices showing signs of no real home, no bathtub. Demoralization is backing up in classrooms across America, keeping up the tired work. Enough clothes and books should fit in our car home. Keep putting the students first. Remember to teach them critical thinking. Fate holds us by the string, urges us to be a kite, but doesn't let us go anywhere. Bathtubs are useless, so was the noisy fridge. We can still gather like good neighbors, shower at the Y, dress in vintage professor vests. All adjuncts could march away from campuses across America all at once. Our signs would say equal pay for equal work or show a photo of our dog the neighbors poisoned with crack. Teach Frederick Douglass, keep the words of Red Jacket ringing in the students' ears. Then all adjuncts rise, declare higher ed subsumed by oligarchy, fated to perpetuate U.S. domestic violence, PTSD from bed bugs. Neighboring countries scoff at us for throwing the water out with the bathtubs until the sea at a shining sea rises with voters gunning for a wall, shooting up tubs of higher thought, piles of Emerson lectures, MLK speeches, tomes of words our country has whittled into memes. What will Facebook say? What will the neighbors think when students throng behind all of us, marching and chanting, keeping our backs turned to the dumbing down, resuming control of our fate, ever snipping the strings that bind our forefathers' declaration to hypocrisy? Adjuncts, we're not just tired of hearing our neighbors while taking a bath. We must keep slavery out of America, corporate decisions out of education overturn our fate, refuse to be adjuncts. Our used-up souls will find buoyancy in our stride as we walk away. 
Yeah, once again, that was Rebecca Snow reading her poem, Sestina for Adjuncts. And the one thing I want to point out is how important it is to have unique words in the Sestina. Because you hear the echoes because they're unique words. Um, you can have a few words. She has our, which is one, um, you know, one word that's pretty common and you know, doesn't have a lot of content, but mostly they're, they're interesting words that you remember. You, you know, you're going to hear this poem, um, these words, seven times. Um, you know, that's why it's called Sestina. I, I said six before. It's seven times because you have the last one too. And um, you're going to hear these words seven times. They have to be words that you notice when you hear them seven times to get the form to really work. So she's got adjunct, uh, bathtub, fate, and neighbors are really unusual words that, you know, we don't say all that often, especially probably bathtub um, is probably the most unusual to appear in a poem. And it's really sort of part of the fun of a sestina is to have those words sort of have an anticipation of like, how is she going to fit bathtub back in this poem seven times? You know, and then different ways you can use bathtub. Um, a lot of times people like to play, you know, some people disagree with how much variation on the word they want. So if you look at the Rattlecast last week, Erica Reed talked a lot about her sestinas. She transitions and moves them around a lot to set up a lot of variety within those end words. Other poets feel like they should be really pure. You can kind of pick whichever way you want to do there. Um, Rebecca's a little bit in the middle between the two. She has mostly the same words, but then, um, you know, faded, faded is one, so she re conjugates she turns this into a noun the fates um and then bathtub later was just you know there was just tubs here so a few things changed a little bit to keep variety but what you want in these is just to have a poem or a lot of stuff's going on so that you notice these uh these repetitions these words sneak back and they're really good for poems that have a kind of either obsessive quality or representing something that's kind of monotonous too like like something like the drudgery of going to work as an adjunct every day it's why this poem works so well is because the form fits the content really well it's this long grueling work that she's trying to explain this is for our tribute to adjunct um adjunct teachers issue and it's tough being an adjunct you know we talked to um um who was it uh I don't know. We talked to somebody who, who was traveling to like four separate schools, um, all in each different cardinal directions, like 50 miles away. So one day she'd travel north for two hours and then south for two hours, and then west. Uh, oh, Jennifer John, that's who it was. And, uh, and, and it's really tough being an adjunct. And to, you get this sort of sense of this sort of never ending grind, too. Um, so it's a good poem for that kind of content. So anyway, I just thought we'd talk about the Sestina a little bit before we do our uh, get into the actual critiques. Um, just to help some people out. We did have some feedback from a few people after the Rattlecast last week who said that you know, they had to Google and look up what these forms were, the, the Sestina or the Tritina. I should say, too, the Tritina is the same thing except with three. Um, so you take three words. Um, so here it's like adjunct, bathtub, and fate, and then you repeat them and just use those three words and then have a one-line ending. And that's the difference. It's, it cuts it down to size. Um, so anyway, that is the Sestina. Let's see if anybody has any other comments or questions before we move on to the actual critiques. Let's see. Yeah. And we should mention too, if you want to look back at, um, at the Rattlecast, I, I didn't want to repeat that, but Erica Reed had this great new style of Sestina. It's a, I mean, she called it like a Reed Sestina or something. I've never seen anybody do it. More like a guzzle or a haiku sequence or a, a hyben or something where each stanza, if you look back at here for a second, um, each stanza um, is like its own isolated story. And so we have a, we leap between each stanza. So it's sort of like, you know, this is six lines about this. And I really like that. I'm trying to, to be honest, mine is an attempt at doing that because I think that's really interesting and gets over the the length of the Sestina is the one that, that I always find. You know, it's hard to keep my interest for that long, although some poems do. And it's really great if you can do it. And uh, there we go. So that's Sestina. If you want to look back, though, at Erica Reads, she talked about like 10 minutes in or 15 minutes in. We had a good five or 10 minute conversation just about her style of Sestina, which as far as I know, she invented. So look back at that last Rattlecast, too, if you want to see that. Um, let's see. Anything else to mention? Yeah. So Tara Mezzo, like, man, love that poem. That, that poem, that Sestina for Adjuncts, kind of went viral because, you know, adjunct professors shared that really widely. It, it appeared in a few, was reprinted in a few places. I can't remember exactly where, um, but adjunct type, like industry magazines and things like that. And, you know, it's the kind of poem um, that people who don't really read a lot of poetry can really appreciate. So it was a really popular poem. And because it's so, so memorable and it's so much stuff. Yeah. Um, and let's see, any other comments here? 
Yeah, did she call it braided? Yeah, Brian O'Sullivan says Erica might have called it braided. Or did I just say braided? I'm not sure what she calls it. We have to we'll double check. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, and Emily Arnold Fernandez says, Bathtub is such an interesting symbol. Here it evokes both luxury to have a bath, to lounge in a bath, and poverty. Putting kids to sleep in the bathtub to avoid stray bullets. So great here. Yeah, that's another great point. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Emily, because using different context between the words is really important, too. Like, you want them to be buried with a lot of variety, even though you have this sort of echo um, you know, refraining through the poem. And so having bathtub have c- completely different context to be used is a really great thing to think about. Like how, when you pick your six words, how can you use them in different ways is the thing to make a really lively, interesting sestina. And then, as always with forms, we want the form to be driving us deeper into our imagination and our subconscious. And so how can you use that form? You know, it's really easy to see how that happens with rhyme and meter because you're forced to make different choices and think about words you wouldn't have thought to fit the rhyme and to get into that, like you think of different words that wouldn't have come up in your head while you're writing a rhyming poem, it can be the same thing with Sestina. You can think, how can I go to different places with these words? And that can push you in a new surprising directions to make the poems much more interesting. So that's why Sestina does work too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so great comment. Thanks for saying that, Emily. I, um, all right. Now let's see. Let's go on to our actual critiques. And we're going to move through again. We haven't done this in a few weeks. Uh, we're going to do try to mix it up a little bit more. I'm getting a little more caught up. We're up to June. It's not terrible, but I do want to get caught up as many as I can um, so that we're a little more timely with the critiques. This is Dana Wilkinson from June 12th, 2023. If you want to submit, go to rattle.com slash critique. You can submit there or just through Submittable to our critique. It's only considered for critique if you submit it to the Critique of the Week category on Submittable. But if you'd like to submit a poem or two, hopefully two, um, then do it there. And uh, of course, if I see you participating here all the time, I'll move you to the top of the line as well, so you don't have to wait. But the people I don't really see participating um, themselves, we're just going to go to the back of the line. And the line's pretty long at this point. We're uh, 87 poems deep and going back to Jan- June 12th of last year. So anyway, this is Dana Wilkinson. The poem is Believing, and uh, no questions or comments other than the poem itself. So let's take a look once it loads. Come on, submittable, you can load. Okay, hang on. Sometimes it does this where it doesn't load. I'm going to refresh the page, and I might have to re-log in. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Submittable is having a little issues. Hopefully, it'll pop up faster this time. It froze logging into for a little bit, but here we go. This is Believing. Again, the poet is uh, Dana Wilkinson from uh, Huntington Beach, California, sent in this poem, Believing. Believing. A daughter's tears for her mother do not end with the incineration of ashes on a warm September morning. The shade of trees narrows and the billowing wind continues to course its way through the veins to sting and thud the heart. Unspeakable, the loss of a godmother followed by the loss of a mother still vibrant and needed, before the mind could process the gravity of the first expiration, before the tears streamed from her eyes and itched her cheeks and blurred her vision, offering momentary reprieve from the lingering ache of reality. Her heart, however, remained unmoved by the shock upon shock, deaf, frozen to the murmuring and whispering around her, She stood on the precipice, looked downward into the vast emptiness. Others reached out to stroke her arm and sing melodies of God, reminding her of his faithfulness, an amorphous force that had somehow enveloped both godmother and mother in one mighty swing. The outrageousness of the double loss caused bile to rise to her consciousness. One funeral was enough. She thought two funerals within days obscene. She sat bewildered, faith torn. She hated God. The morning her grand godmother departed de- sorry the morning of her godmother's departure was dark and still her sister sighed gently in the next room when the shade of her gra- godmother softly unlatched the door and stood in the parlor patiently waiting to say goodbye at first she believed it might be her mother that the venom of cancer had reattached itself to her tender form but the presence carried a fragrance not belonging to her mother, one of citrus and rain, and, so she understood before the phone rang, the news of her mother's death came less cordially 
shared over the phone in staggered tongue her father's heroic in moments of destruction brought the news to her with love and faith and goodness attached she wondered why it could not have been him when he echoed her thoughts she sat mute shame curling around her intestines sputtering outwards bending her world the rosary was beautiful her godmother encased in glossy oak her strawberry red hair brushed and gleamed, hands folded neatly above her belly, so she touched the opal skin of her cheek, her hand lingered, feeling damp chill of death. She would not attend the funeral. She had said goodbye to her godmother, and all residual ceremony, only memory and love remained. The morning before her mother's funeral, before she could board the plane to sail to her family's side and finish her grief, the world collapsed around her, the twin towers crumbled, shaking precedence over single loss, strangely muffling personal tragedy. She must find another way to say goodbye to her mother. The world coalesced as the tires moved across gravel, windy roads, freeways, a river of light surrounded her, ushering her as she moved towards her mother. Deliberately now, she pursued the love of her life. To the very edges of her universe, she traveled, running and stumbling and falling to her knees, believing in the truth and everlastingness of love and final reunion. Um, so that was this poem. It's a pretty long one, Believing, by Dana Wilkinson. And to me, I think the poem... Um, my, my first thought is that it goes on a little too long, um, which is frequently my thought. I mean, you'll, you'll see that very often is something I say here, because really, um, you know, attention is the currency of the 21st century. It's hard to keep people's attention. Um, and, you know, it's, some people can stretch out poems for a long time and make them work, but it's pretty rare um, to stay engaged on that level for that long. One of the reasons why, um, I always think about this, but in poetry readings, we love you know, the audience really responds when we have this sort of extemporaneous talk between poems, describing them and chatting a little bit. It's to break the mood of tension because we just don't have that focused amount of time we spend on stuff very often um, in the way that poetry is an intense focus. And uh, and so having poems shorter and make sure that you keep people's attention the whole way through is really important. I think this poem has some interesting lines and um, an interesting story that, that is compelling. It feels too long for itself. So I would try to cut this in half and make it a one page poem instead of two. I and mean, that's the first thing. Um, and, and just like, what do you really need? Like what elements, uh, what elements are not cliched? What elements are really original? Uh, what elements, what plot points do you need to tell the story and, and try to move through them a little more quickly is my first thought. Um, but let's see, um, let's see what other people are saying for now. And I have to switch things up a little bit. So hang on a second. I want to go like this. I forgot I have to be able to look at two screens at the same time. <laughs> so bear with me for a second. Uh, we're going to go like this, and then I can see them both. Right, so here's screen view, but we want it to be this one. No, we want it to be this one. Okay, so let's see uh, what everybody else is saying right now. Yeah, so James Spencer, then that's what I said. It's not just um, that um, the poem itself goes on, but a lot of stuff happens in the poem too. You know, between like the, the Twin Towers um, thing, it appears out of nowhere almost, um, you know, here in the poem, which is which is 75% through the poem. Um, and so and it's just a lot of stuff fit in. And as, um, you know, Winston Munn says, too much explanation, it seems for me. It got uninteresting starting around the third or fourth stanza. Um, Dick Westheimer says, I would try to turn this into a sonnet. Heavy emotion content, um, emotional content benefits from the constrained form. Um, another poet says a lot of prose. Um, yeah, Lisa Seidenberg says the Twin Tower stands that got my attention. And me too. I sort of snapped back. Like it, it was a uh, late detail, very unexpected. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, get that earlier in the poem. Let us know the entire context as we're moving through it so we can feel more. Um, yeah. And Ruth Kennedy says there are enough specifics draw me into the story and to relate to these losses. Um, a lot of explanation, but not a lot happens, says another poet. Um, I'm looking for the discovery. And Katie Dozier says uh, she took a break from, from making dinner to say, I think it's the lack of discovery that makes it feel like prose to me, not just the length. Like what was going to be expressed was totally known beforehand. Yeah, so that's true. So 
So what we want to do with this poem is, is condense it into some kind of package that allows us to tell the story quickly and succinctly and tightly in a way that too surprises ourselves. And I think that's and so Dick's comment uh, of making it a sonnet would be beneficial. You know, having some kind of strict form, even if it's like, you know, I, I mentioned already, I'm not a huge fan of syllabics just to my ear. I don't hear them, and so I'm not. But syllabics work to con- confine you into space. So if you want to say, I'm going to have 11, 11 syllables per line, and this is going to be six stanzas long with uh, five lines each or something like that, just some arbitrary thing off the top of your head, that'll force you to, c- to condense the poem and tell the story more quickly. Because the beats just take too long to happen. There's sort of too many of them um, to be engaging. Uh, so let's see, where would we start the poem? If we're, I'm going to read the very beginning really quick, then we'll move on to the next poem. But Believing a daughter's tears for her mother do not end with the incineration of ashes on a warm September morning. We get the September here, um, but we have no idea it's that September. Um, so maybe some kind of reference to that would help, you know, in the title or something like that. Um, the shade tree na- trees narrow and the billowing wind continues to course its way through the veins to sting and thud the heart. So to me, if you if you want to talk about um, what to condense, um, a daughter's tears for her mother do not end with the incineration of ashes. That could be a nice title too, but that's detailed enough detail. And the warm September morning, that September is a good detail. But then the shade of trees narrows and the billowing wind continues to course its way through the veins to sting and thud the heart. That's like too abstract and too much like we're reading a Thomas Hardy novel or something. Um, you know, that where we're just getting these long, elaborate explanations or like those chapters in, um, um, I can't remember what I'm thinking of. But anyway, the, um, where we're just getting these long explanations of the setting, um, that doesn't really add a whole lot to the poem. Um, and so that loses my interest there a little bit. Unspeakable, the loss of godmother, followed by the loss of a mother still vibrant and needed before the mind could process the gravity of the first expiration before the tears streamed from her eyes and itched to her cheeks and blurred her vision. So there is this, even though it's really unspoken, and we don't get to it until the Twin Towers, there is this metaphor of the Twin Towers being two towers, both hit, both collapsed by an attack, and then these two deaths, these two griefs being like that too, and the collapsing of yourself into grief. Um, So you have that metaphor sort of set up and implied in what's going on, but really not done directly. And so another thing you might want to do is look at some other 9-11 poems. Um, the Shimborska poem is, is maybe one of the best, you know, the one that refuses to end. But there are a whole bunch of poems about 9-11. And, and think about how to describe that and condense it into a short form where you get these emotions in uh, much more succinctly. Um, so there's that. Okay, let me, uh, let's see if there's any other comments to pass along. Yeah, Mary Picot says, I perhaps begin in the middle where she gets the news. Yeah, I, I, if we were jumping right into that scene, um, that would work better. Um, yeah, Mary Picot says, too, is the title about believing or grief combined with 9-11, perhaps something that describes grief, the collapse, perhaps. Um Aaron Sickler says, could start with the delivery of news that forks into a personal and public event. I think that, yeah, to keep the dualism. I think that's a good idea, too, uh, from Aaron Sickler. Hmm. Brian O'Sullivan says, also, I think taking precedence over single loss made the 9-11 beat too abstract. Maybe it could have been a more concrete image, like falling towers crushing her, dark flowers. And I mean, I really, what we want to do with this poem, I mean, I say it this way is to actually not be told the story uh, of what happened in these two deaths coinciding with the terrorist attacks and the Twin Towers um, and having that change it, but actually be in that moment. Like, think about how you could make us, as you're writing this, be right there. And a few people already suggested to start uh, with the news arriving um, and actually, like, show that scene of that day where you found out these three, really, pieces of news uh, in that and puts us in the scene and makes us feel what it felt like, you know, to have some idea of what it felt like to have these two losses coinciding with the, the terrorist attacks where everyone was focused on. Because um, it must be really surreal. Um, you know, I have a friend of mine who was fired, or he lost his job, he says, on 9-11, and he worked in New York. Uh, it was just total coincidence. He um, got fired and then went down and outside and crashed into the thing. Like, he showed up at work one morning and they said, go home. <laughs> and then... 
and then that happened. And so the the just the strangeness of that is always interesting. That the, how bizarre that would feel to have this like personal tragedy, really, because losing something like that, losing a job is is like losing a family member or something. A lot of times for a lot of people, and having that coincide with this public event and having that private public grief going on and strange, it's just a surreal feeling. That's really interesting, I think, to share in a poem. So focus more on being in that moment. And I think that will really help the poem come to life. Okay, let's move on to another one. And um, before we do, let me, let me click this so I know that we went over it. And we'll go next to, this is Jessica Campbell. The poem is The Wisdom Tree. Again, no questions. Jessica's from uh, Oregon. And she sends this. Um, interesting font, too. Here we go. The Wisdom Tree. The Wisdom Tree. In a forgotten grove where silence prevails, stands the wisdom tree with tales to unveil. Its roots delve deep, reaching through time, gathering wisdom in branches sublime. From its ancient boughs, wisdom cascades, lessons of old in whispers and shades. Through stormy seasons and tranquil days, the wisdom tree thrives forever ablaze. Its leaves, the pages of countless tales of love and loss, of resilience that prevails. With every breeze, its wisdom takes flight, guiding lost souls toward their inner light. So seek the wisdom tree with reverence and awe. Let its teachings ignite your inner core. For in its embrace, you shall surely find the answers that dwell within your mind. Um, so that is the wisdom tree. Uh, again, the poet was um, Jessica Campbell. And so first of all, the thing that stands out right away um, is just the font. So I might as well address that. You know, it really, the publisher is going to use the font. No matter who the publisher is, what you're having published, the font is up to the publisher, not the poet. We don't do, unless you're making like a broadside and you're an artist and doing things, um, you know, f getting a fancy font is not something you want to do. It shows, uh, first of all, it's not, it doesn't matter what font it is. And it shows that you don't really understand how it works, too. So it's sort of a sign, you know, anytime you see, as soon as it pops up, you're like, as an editor reading submissions over and over again, no matter who the editor is, you're going to say, oh, this isn't like a professional, a person who knows what the, what the game is, what the situation is, probably hasn't read a lot, um, hasn't s shared poems very often. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, just telling you that, you know, use a font that's really standard. You don't want to use a font that makes you think about the font because the content of the poem is what matters. I mean, the poem is not the words on the page. The poem is the shape of the breath, the dance in the mouth, and it doesn't really matter what your font is. The, um, the, you know, the editors publish a, use a font for reading ease, for the feel, you know, in that way, but they choose it. There's, you're never going to see a magazine where every poem is in a different font. So just don't bother submitting with different fonts. It's a, it's a waste of time and shows that you don't realize it's a waste of time, I guess, and so you don't want to do that. Now, uh, this poem is a sort of a classical type uh, rhyming poem, and I, I think what the thing to do here, the main thing we should think about, um, just notice here that um, every line, there's no enjambment. Every line ends with a comma or a period, you know, um, and so we fit that into that form. And really, we, um, you know, if you look at anything over the last, like, 150 years or so, uh, it's something we try to avoid. There aren't many poems that have rhyming full stop endings for their lines. Um, and it's something even, you know, if you look back at Shakespeare, there's a lot of enjambment in Shakespeare. And it's because having the same rhythm and pattern over and over again gets redundant and kind of sing song. It feels more like a nursery rhyme. And what we want to do is have, have a tension between that, some surprise. Like we're set, trying to set up a poem in which the readers are interested in engaging with. And part of that, the whole reason to do meter and rhyme is to sort of set up that expectation and then break it to a certain degree. And you're playing within the two. It's not just getting it right um, as you expect every time. The, the real energy from a formal poem is from the variation within that. Um, and, and the variation comes from having, having the, uh, the sentences continue past the line. So you, it doesn't really end there. And you push forward. So the, rhymes end up, the lines end up having different kind of lengths and different kind of rhythms. And it ends up being surprising. And because of the way our brains work, that's what we're attracted to. We, want, we, we are really pattern recognition machines. Or when we love, we get this little dopamine reward. It's like an actual drug when we recognize a pattern. So we're always looking for patterns and looking for changes in patterns. And that keeps us engaged with the poem. So that's why it's really important to have that enjambment. If you don't know what that is, look up that word enjambment. 
Um, but but having the lines continue, and if you look at something like, you know, this similar reminds me of some you know classic like Robert Frost type poems. But if you look at Robert Frost type poems, he uses a lot of enjambment, a lot of surprise within that regularity. So so, um, but but what I want to say too is that there's a really nice use of the rhyme, and it feels nice to read. So in a forgotten grove where silence prevails, stands the wisdom tree with tales to unveil. Its roots delve deep, reaching through time, gathering wisdom in branches sublime. You know, the use of the rhythm and rhyme, even though it's sort of too regular and written toward the rhyme a little bit and, and um, you know, a little bit more sing-songy, there is, you can feel the pleasure um, that you, the poet, have in writing the poem. And so it's a great sign that, the, that once you dive into, you know, more, um, you know, complicated poems, like what Robert Frost was actually writing like, uh, then I think you'll really enjoy that and, and start writing really great poems. Um, so the, the really playing within specific details and, and variation within the rhyme is going to take you really far, I think, if you, if you start reading more like that. So anyway, that is the comment for this one. Let's move on to the next one. Um, let's see. Here we go like this. Mark it so I remember. Okay. Um, next we have, you. they will never know. Um, am I enough or just trying in vain? What makes someone a true poet? That's an interesting question. Um, Luisa de, um, de Araujo is the poet from Celeste St. Cloud. Not sure where that is. I'm kind of curious. Now, let me look up. Where's... I'm going to look this up. Because I'm curious. Celeste St. Cloud. That is in zooming out. Ah, oh, that's outside of Paris. That's interesting. Okay. So this is uh, Luisa de Araujo with um, Outside of Paris. And the poem is They Will Never Know. Here we go. They Will Never Know. I'm the daughter of a white man and a black woman. I'm the mixture of two paths. I'm a mix of stories. I am the result of love between two people of different colors, but with the same. I'm the result of the love of two people who came from different situations, the different creations and different creations. I'm the daughter of a black woman. I am the daughter of a woman who's a maid. I am the daughter of a woman who is repressed every day for her color by society. I am the daughter of a woman that society sees as shame, like the ugly duckling of history. I am the daughter of the woman who has been in this country for so long. I am the daughter of a woman who every day lives a struggle against discrimination, prejudice, violence, exclusion, oppression. I am the daughter of a black woman that constitutes the basis of this nation as its ancestors who carried within their souls generations and generations of women and men that, this, that to this day remain that to this day make your story not forgotten. I'm the daughter of the revolution. Um, so for this one, um, you know, the question was what makes someone a poet? And, and to me, I think the what a poet is, it's, it's someone who explores the world through language. And that's really the simplest basis um, for what poetry is, in, in my opinion. It's using language as a tool of understanding so that other people um, at one level, but even more primarily yourself can have a better understanding of the world, a better view of the world. And so a poet is someone who, you know, takes language, takes the, the ways that, that syntax and structure and sound, there's a musicality to the way we speak. Someone who uses that to generate access to their subconscious thoughts and bring them forward and surprise themselves and then surprise and delight others so we all become more human. That's what a poet is. And so if you're pushing toward that, if that's what you're trying to do, then you're a poet. That's my, my quick definition. Um, um, and so here, I think there, there's poetic elements here, but to me, so, so the thing that, that makes this poem poetic, there's, there's one of the things that's really popular in more modern poetry is we get less away from the meter or farther away from the meter and rhyme that we saw in the last poem um, is, is the typical way is to use rhythm of speech as sort of the part that's music. And there is a great rhythm here because of that repetition of I'm the daughter of this, I'm the mixture of this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. Um, you know, that repetition makes this, 
it sort of propels us into the category of poem. Let's say so. I think that works. And then exactly what we were talking about with the last poem with rhyme, we want to do the same thing with repetition, where we set it up only to break it and play with it and twist it, because that's how you keep people engaged on that linguistic musical level. It's the same thing if you're listening to like a symphony orchestra or something. There are these little movements, and then they come back and repeat. It's the same thing in that sestina, where you get those words that repeat over and over again. Um, you know, our brains are really stimulated by um, looking for looking for patterns seeing them broken, seeing how they can be twisted and manipulated. We love that. We just can't help it. It's, it really, it's in our DNA. That's how humans evolved. And so making patterns, breaking patterns, playing within the patterns is the same thing. And so you see it in music with the, you know, the way that the verse and refrain and bridge structure, that bridge comes in and it's different. We get like a jolt from that in a song. And there's so many things where you see that because that's really how things work um, within the human neurophysiology. So what we want to do is have this structure uh, and then find ways to repeat it for a while and then break it at the right times. And that's kind of what you're going for with a poem, um, and especially a poem that's rhythmic like this. The, the, so that's the thing that's working, I think. That, I think the, the repetition sets it up as a poem. I think playing more with variety, but it does do some play with variety in it. That, that works really well. Um, the one thing here, though, I think it ends up being kind of preachy. Like I, I said at the very beginning, a poet is someone who explores their world through language. And there's not really enough exploring here because it feels like it's something that you know you wanted to say ahead of time. And so to, to the point is to really dig down and find something that surprises yourself. Um, you know, there's the adage, I think it was Frost, no surprise for the reader, no surprise for the writer, no tears for the reader, no tears for the writer. Maybe it was someone else. I don't know who said that. Uh, every time they quote somebody, you might be wrong. But, um, but that applies no matter who actually said it. Um, you know, you have to sort of feel while you're writing the poem. And if you can feel while you're writing the poem, you can sort of feel your way through into making other people feel. And that's what we want to do with the poem. So the fact that we sort of get to this, you know, I'm the daughter of a revolution, it, f it feels like, you know, you wanted to say that at the very beginning, that this was, the, you set out to say, I'm the daughter of the revolution is, you know, I want to write a poem about that. And you wrote to that, knowing that you were going to write to that. There's just no surprise here. Um, and so... A great way, really what we want to do is let our subconscious go and let ourselves be free to surprise ourselves and to say things that we didn't realize we thought, you know. And so you can use the rhythm, I'm the daughter of a white man and a black woman. I'm the mixture of two paths. I'm a mix of stories. And I think that's that set of three, we get those three rhythm. And if you break out here into somewhere surprising, like don't police or monitor or think about what you're saying. Say, I'm the daughter of a white man and a black woman and the mixture of two paths and a mix of stories that blah, 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 blah. And then start telling the story and let the rhythm sort of propel the story. That's what we want to do with the poem. So we get to somewhere surprising. Um, and then the issue with this poem is it just doesn't go anywhere like that. It goes exactly where you expect it to go when you set it out, like you were writing an essay. And poems and essays are two very different things. Um, so that is my thoughts for this one. Um... Yeah, another poet, I mean, other, I think the comments are probably going to all say the same thing different ways. So another poet says, I want to see the conflict, not be told of it. Exactly. So we're, we're told, we're shown, you know, I'm the daughter of a black woman who's a maid. I'm the daughter of a woman who's a maid uh, um, right there. Instead of saying I'm the daughter of a woman who's a maid, I'm the daughter of a woman who wakes up and does this every day, who folds these things, who does this for this person. Like, let us actually see that and riff on that. Like, riff on those specific details to you and your story that you're telling us, and then try to find ways to surprise yourself while you're doing it. Um, Dick Westheimer suggests start with the last line and see what's emerged. That's another way. I mean, if you know you want to write a poem about being um, the daughter of the revolution, um, and, and that's where it's going, what you want to do is push forward farther into that and figure out why. Why do you want to be the daughter of revolution? What does that actually mean to you? What would that look like? Um, you know, and so one thing, like Dick suggests, start out with that as the, the first line and then see where you can surprise yourself from that point because you already know what you wanted to say there. Um, let's see. Um, James Spencer says, I hope this doesn't sound too personal, but I wanted to respond to someone who is also biracial, black father, white mother. This poem has to push deeper after Shane McRae, Adrian Piper. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what... So everyone's going to say the same thing, because that's really the truth of the poem, is that there's nothing that surprised you here, so we're not surprised. And so find a way to surprise yourself. But like the last poet, too, 
there's a really, you can see the love of language in that repetition that came out. There's a rhythm to the poem that makes it a poem and makes you a poet. It's just try to surprise yourself rather than write what you're already expecting to write. Okay. Um, any another poet has agreed with James Spencer. Yeah. Okay. Let's go um, to another poet. And again, I will mark this so I can let them know it was here. And let's go next. Next up is Calliope Palios from Fairlawn, New Jersey. Um, Palios has no, or Calliope has no questions, but thanks for the chance to be considered and critiqued. Uh, the first poem is an ekphrastic Hunch image, which is in public domain. Good to note. If you ever submit poems to a magazine that are ekphrastic and want to include the image so we know, it really helps if it's public domain, or at least let us know that you have permission somehow, because it's really hard to get permission for some art. It's just the, the truth. So we couldn't even publish it if it was something that we had to pay thousands of dollars for the, for the permission. You know. So anyway, here we go. Two poems here. Again, we're up to June 20th of last year. And um, this poem, this, this art is in the public domain. La Princesse de Lambale by Anton Hickel, Bohemia. You can hear how terrible I am at saying, <laughs> pronouncing foreign languages. I wish I was better at, at that. But um, here we go. This is the painting. And... Um, Yeah, that's the painting. And so here's the poem. Gossip with Madame La Bambale, I guess. <laughs> Honestly, she wrote so little. It might as well be a painting of dogs playing poker. Still, under our clothes, we wear such gowns every day. Somehow people sense them. No, you can't see her necklace. Yet each of us wears the same soft capsule around our velvety throats. For example, say you and I introduce ourselves, each of us too polite to get into the fine details. Yet, in fact, you're going to die, as am I. Neither of us has read the message in our capsule, the rules of the game, and when you'll have to throw in your hand, as likely neither you nor I will be torn limb from limb by a frenzied mob. Likely historians will not shout at each other about whether or not a rabid soldier tore off our labia to wear as a mustache. For example, our severed head won't be freshly made up, curls perfect, foisted upon a spike, gleeful parade past the queen's window. No, our hours are somewhat quiet. We languish, playing solitaire, enjoying the fascinating thoughts prancing through our heads as we place our bets and lose again. Now, if you could read your capsule, your mind would dismantle itself. You'd perhaps find her lace handkerchief somewhere under your own robe and try to tell people about it. We are one, maybe somewhere in the drawer of a pretty little desk, some pleasant afternoon, playing at being a lady. You'd find a silver pistol in the drawer and realize you're playing Russian roulette. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So, so I think this does a great job of, um, you know, move this so we can see it a little better all at once. Um, and this is, again, once again, the picture that we have. And uh, I think this does a great job in ekphrastic poems, which is what this is. That's a, a poem written after a painting. One of the great moves is just to speak for the person within the painting and make it a um, um, a persona poem. And and so here we have that, sort of, because we, we don't have it in the first person, but we have access to her thoughts. And so um, gossip with Madame La Bambale. <laughs> Honestly, she wrote so little, it might as well be a painting of dogs playing poker. So, so right there, and I think it's a great opening. I really enjoyed this um, because, you know, it, it sort of tells us what we're thinking, which is a way to get sort of on board with it. Um, and it sort of accesses the thoughts of the, like, it's like somebody knew um, the actual person. And so we get to have that sort of inside info. Another thing we love to do as humans is like gossip and <laughs> hear, you know, get the tea. And we get to have that sense here. So it's a, it's a sort of fun way to open a poem, you know, having some kind of conversation. It's in the voice of somebody who knows this person, which is great. Um, honestly, she wrote so little, it might as well be a painting of dogs playing poker. One thing I would point out here, you know, the still and then the, the, the irregularity of the punctuation, unless it serves a good purpose, I would really highly recommend just using regular punctuation. 
So, um, you know, so end this was a period, um, you know, a comma there instead of a period. I'm not sure why it's a period. Um, you know, and continue with regular punctuating throughout, unless you have a really good reason not to. I don't see a good reason in this poem, so so I definitely punctuate it correctly. Um, yeah. Tambrella says, I'm not sure, but I think sometimes the art may be beyond copyright, but the photo of the art is not. Um, and that could be, it is complicated. Um, but, yeah. Let's see. Dick says, uh, my wife, first reader, would roll her eyes at the honestly. She'd say, just effing say it. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, there is that. But I think if um, if you're writing in the voice. So, so to me, the poem is written in the voice of some kind of confidant that's telling you more than the, the sto- that story you'd get from the painting. And I think that honestly sets it up. You know, honestly, she wrote so little, it might as well be a painting of dogs. The one thing about the painting of dogs is it feels... Um, um, what's the word for, like, it's not anachronistic because it's, well, is it anachronistic? I guess it is, even in this direction. It's something they wouldn't have, the dogs playing poker painting is like the 20th century. And this one is, um, you know, this painting is 1788. So the person speaking wouldn't know what a dog's playing poker is. And she would have to know, be speaking from the, to someone in the future who would get that reference. There's something a little odd about that. And if you're going to do something like that, I'd continue that and play up and have fun with that. It's an angle that you can have to add detail and interest to the poem. Um, if you're not going to do it again and it really doesn't come up again, I would cut that to, for consistency. Um, anyway, still under our clothes. We wear such gowns every day. Somehow people sense them. No, you can't see her necklace. Yet each of us wears the same soft capsule around our velvety throats. And again, that's a great, I like the soft capsule around our velvety throats and sort of the mystery that that sets up, wondering what that is. For example, say you and I introduce ourselves, each of us so too polite to get into the fine details. Um, yet in fact, you're going to die as am I. So here, I think we had some nice, we had the velvety throats and we we're talking about the gowns and the dogs playing poker. Um, we we're talking about the details in the painting. We have a lot of detail here. And this stanza, you know, we're too polite to get into the fine details. Instead of fine details, give us a detail that's fine so that we stay engaged in that level of really concrete images and things. Um, you know, that's a leap into vagary that, that the poem would be better, stronger if we, we went more specific there. Yet, in fact, you're going to die as am I. Neither of us has read the message in our capsule, the rules of the game, and when you'll have to throw in your hand. So this gets a little clunky, too, in this section. Um, I, I kind of like the setup of the game. I like the idea that that's what we're doing here. Uh, but I think it needs to be shown a little more clearly. So it's lacking kind of clarity here. Um... Um, anyway, as likely, neither you nor I will be torn limb from limb by a frenzied mob. Likely, historians will not shout at each other about whether or not a rabid soldier tore off our labia to wear as a mustache. See, that's a good detail. You know, that is the kind of thing up here it didn't have. And so dive into those details, because that, that brings the poem back to life. For example, our, and I wouldn't do the for example. I think that Dick, what Dick Westheimer said about the honestly applies here to for example. Um, it doesn't feel natural to a voice you're trying to establish. And so just jump into the, our severed head. There's no re- need for the for example. But, but again, I think the really nice part about the poem is the strangeness of the voice of who's speaking and the dogs playing poker. And we kind of lose that and get more into just a straightforward story. And it's, it's less interesting there. Um, okay. So, so I think, you know, keeping these details, keeping it feeling like a voice, that some interesting character, some person with personality is actually telling you this, uh, I think that really is a strength of the poem at the beginning, and we got to keep that the whole way through. Um, let's see. For example, our severed head won't be freshly made up, curls perfect, foisted up on a spike, gleeful parade past the queen's window. Um, so great details there. Just don't need the for example. No, our hours are somewhat quiet. We languish playing solitaire, enjoying the fascinating... So I don't know who the R is either. I think that's part of the problem, too. I imagine it's somebody dated back here um, because, you know, she wrote so little. Uh, but, you know, later on in the poem, the R becomes the present, and so that's sort of a drift, a change in, in the perspective. Um, 
And I think sticking to, I, I talk about this all the time, but it's really important and really works well to have a specific character, not you necessarily. Um, it could be you, but it could be anybody. Imagine the actual person. I, I, I mention this all the time. Aron Kirch, he's a poet we've had in our podcast a bunch of times or a few times. He, um, he has these novels that are really popular young adult novels. And he has this entire map he makes of the town that he makes up um, within the novel. So he knows which every street is named, what every person who lives in the, each house on the street is like, which businesses are on the main street, all that kind of stuff, even though he'll maybe use 2% of that fact within the novel itself. But having all that detail surround the world makes the world come to life. And it's the same thing having a specific character, even if we're not going to know who this character is. In your own head, imagine a woman wearing a certain kind of dress, if that's who it is in, in this era. Um, you know, have a certain, you know, an actual person, imagine an actor speaking this to you and speaking to somebody else too. Have it be a conversation between two people. Is she talking to you, the writer? Is she talking to us, the reader? Is she talking to a friend next to her? If you imagine all that, even though it never comes out in the poem, just like the details in Ron Kirchie's map and his novels never come out within his novels, um, it still makes it feel really authentic to have that sense of in your head as you're writing what this voice would be like. Because then you get these all little nuanced effects going on, like the honestly would get more of that, and it would really feel authentic and intimate and more like a poem. So that's, um, that, that, that's a, another piece of advice, too. Um, Let's see. But I, I like the structure. I like I like the setup, and I like this idea of the capsule and the game. Um, I think the Russian roulette at the end is a bit, you know, cliched and unsurprising. So I think maybe the capsule, what's in the capsule, can be something a little bit different than something. I, I understand what the point is, but I think the point's a little too preconceived, maybe. So maybe go f find some other element there. Um, yeah, world building, as Aaron Sickler said. That's that's the the phrase for it. Yeah. Um, Emily Arnold Fernandez says, also, the we'll both die is a lot more interesting if we know who she's friends with, Mary Antoinette, and they'll both die on the guillotine soon after this portrait. Exactly. Like, just those details. So we know who's talking to who about who. Um, and, and you do is the writer, and that keeps everything really authentic. Um, yeah. Um, D. Coleman says, interesting what you researched. Uh, let me see what she researched. I missed that, I think. Or did I read that wrong? Um, is that so? I, I thought you were speculating here, Emily. Did you look that up? Um, that this is friend with Mary Antoinette, and they'll both die in the guillotine soon after this portrait. I, I thought you were imagining that, but that's interesting too. So yeah, let us know that detail too. I mean, you're sort of. I mean, you can think another person you can think of is like the the tour guide in the museum. You know, you don't understand what's going on in this portrait. Yeah, she looked that up. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. So you can imagine that the speaker is the tour guide and give the tour guide some kind of personality. Imagine a real person that's the tour guide showing us this painting and all the things surrounding it, all the backstory, um, what we don't know as we look at this. And then, and then add that to, and maybe the tour guide is just, maybe it's like a tour guide at the museum who has just given up on <laughs> humanity is about to quit so it's their last day in the job and they're telling you all the things that they um wouldn't really say in a tour because they're about to give in their pink slip or whatever you know and so maybe that's something like that um imagine a scenario like that and then tell the story through that voice and it'll come to life a little more it's a really interesting poem and setup though i like it um okay let's see Let's look at friendship really quick. Friendship at a shorter poem, not ekphrastic. Sucking on lemon ices, roaming Melbourne Avenue, together in our comfortable way. I noticed a sweet melting stream carved along my wrist. Saw suddenly there was only one, one's, sorry, one's ice, and I was alone in the warm evening. The pavement tilted, splitting between my feet, a breaking open of a seed and gathering fog pressing in as though I were the hollowness inside a lost purse. Nor did you reveal anything further, giving leave to the street to reflect its rain and me forgotten as any old November night. So interesting poem here. I love that line. Um, where did it go? Um, Pressing in as though I were the hollowness inside a lost purse. The hollowness inside a lost purse is really cool. I'm going to beat everybody to it maybe, but th this would be a great haiku in this poem. Um, and, and that's uh, just a great line. And then also, 
you know, being forgotten is an old November night. I like that line too. So I really like those lines. They're two great lines to work with. How do we build this into a poem? So friendship. And whenever you see a, a one word title, the first thing I think is that it's probably going to be some kind of metaphor for friendship is what the poem really is. Um, or it's a, you know, about friendship too, but, but we'll see sucking on lemon ices, roaming Melbourne Avenue together in our comfortable way. I like that a nice setup. We get, we get a quick details to paint a little scene. I notice a sweet melting stream carve along my wrist. So we go from something really specific and easy to see to, I'm not sure what that means. I noticed a sweet melting stream carve along my wrist. Saw suddenly there was only once ice. Uh, only once ice. I, I really, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. A sweet melting stream carve along my wrist and saw suddenly there was only once ice. And I was alone in the warm evening. I, 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 you lose me there on that part. The pavement tilted, spinning between my feet, a breaking open of a seed and gathering fog. I kind of like that. We get into this sort of unsettled, we're a little lost, um, you know, that kind of like, you get that feeling sometimes where it doesn't feel like the world's real. I, I like the explanation that pressing in as though I were the hollowness inside a lost purse. And I love that line, but I don't really see how it gets there. Um, so to me, I think it was written to a nice place. Um, uh, but how did we get there? I'm a little, little lost. Oh, okay. So I guess I just meant the ice. Marianne Keller says the ice is melting and dripping down her arm. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I had trouble resolving the image. So she's holding uh, like an ice, like a uh, ice cream or um, Italian ice or something, or an ice cube. I noticed a sweet melting stream carve along my wrist. So suddenly there were, there was only once ice, and I was alone in the warm evening. How am I alone in the warm evening? I, that, that leap is too much for me. Um, yeah, I, I just, I got lost at that point. I like some of the lines, but I'm lost in this section. I don't know how it gets from here to the end, which I, 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 I like that hollowness in that I, I assume it's sort of a realization that the friendship is hollow like that and that you're actually alone even though you're together, but I'm not quite sure. I, it's just a trouble following the poem, but I like some of the lines. So we're kind of a little bit more clarity with this one. Let's do one more poem really quick. I got to go in uh, six minutes. Um, actually have to leave for a real reason this time. Let's go to the next one. And we'll, as long as it's not too long. I might skip it if it's long. Let's see. Next up we have Broken Spells. There's no questions or comments. And it is a short one indeed. Okay. So one poem here. This is by Rice Arthurine. Broken Spells. Mesmerized, oops, sorry, I put it on screen. Broken Spells by Arthurine Rice. You see it there. Uh, written a year before it was submitted. This was submitted on uh, June, no, July 6, 2023. Broken Spells. Mesmerized by a soft falling rain, the spell was easily broken by the sounds of an approaching train. A sick looking man was rushing. He seemed to be in much pain. Children stumping in puddles unconcerned about falling rain. A woman rushed past, worried wetness would be ruin her mane. Mesmerized by soft falling rain, the spell was easily broken in this time by a loud flying airplane. So, um, yeah, so, so for this one, again, we get the sort of rhyme that's driving the content. Um, and we want to have rhymes that sort of surprise us as we move through the poem and you as the reader too again this is sort of the theme of today it's a theme very often but we, we set up expectations then surprise ourselves within by changing what how it's pulled off um, and here the rain train pain rain main the rhymes don't feel it doesn't feel surprising it feels more like we pulled up a word and then found a way of writing toward that word would work rather than um yeah so Tamara says a thesaurus poem. Yeah. And Cindy Gunderman says to sing songs. So a lot of the same stuff that, that applies. There is some enjam in here. And I was expecting a little more maybe. Um, but a lot of stuff when I was talking about Frost with that earlier poem and using enjam and applies here. It's that, that having a lot more surprise within the repetition is what stimulates a poem and makes readers want to read. Um, memorized by soft uh, falling rain, the spell was easily broken by... 
a nice break here. But then this, you know, we have rhymes all over, but we have some that don't rhyme. So it's a non-rhyme word, but we do get a nice break. The sounds of an approaching train. A sick-looking man was rushing. He seemed to be in much pain. Like, what do you really say if you saw a sick man? What do you say he seemed to be in much pain? And that's just not the way that we would talk. You know, write like you speak is a really important lesson. That's one of the mottos in, um, in Jack Grape's class uh, that, that we sort of kicked off Rattle 30 years ago. His famous or favorite motto is write like you talk. And it really is important to write like you talk. Or write like it's not write like you talk, but write like somebody talks. Write like that Victorian character from the painting would talk. But, but write in some authentic way. And nobody would say he seemed to be much in pain. Somebody would say he seemed to be in pain. And, and the much is just something extraneous that sort of fits the form of the poem, and we don't want to do that. That takes us out of the fact that we're reading, and makes us think about the fact that we're reading a poem. doesn't feel natural. doesn't feel honest or authentic. Um, it just feels sort of, you know, posing as a poem, and we don't want that. So write like you talk. Find a way to say it in a natural way, fitting within the rhythm and the rhyme, is how formal poems really should be working. Children stumping in puddles, unconcerned about the falling rain. I like that image, um, and I like the way that, I like that whether it's a train, there's the man rushing. Uh, there's a bit of a storytelling going on here that I like. Um, a woman rushed past worried wetness, would, uh, rushed past worried wetness would ruin her mane. Um, and so the mane, you wouldn't say mane in this context. Um, you would say hair. And so we can't just jump from rain to mane because it rhymes when you would really say hair. Um, and so, I mean, that's the kind of thing. That it's When we say that we're writing toward the rhyme and to fit the rhyme, that's what we're talking about, using a word that we wouldn't use, using a diction or a way of speaking that sentence that we wouldn't, just to fit the rhyme scheme is why um, formal poems are a little more difficult to write. Some, a lot of people don't uh, because it's harder to write naturally in that way, but that's also the magic of it, that we can write naturally in that way while also having regularity and form to it. So... So no main, no much pain. we got to do better than that. Mesmerized by soft falling rain. I like the repetition of the fall, soft falling rain. There's a kind of a, um, um, you know, a, a, uh, what's the word? A triolet type quality. There's a lot of French forms that have refrains that repeat like that. It kind of feels triolet-ish in both the length and that repetition. Look into that form, maybe writing in that in this and in this in that form. Um, or the pantoum, like a tiny pantoum. Like, look at some forms and always try to see if you can fit it into form because that makes poems uh, work a little better, too. Mesmerized by soft falling rain, the spell was easily broken, this time by a loud flying airplane. And that, that feels like I thought of a rhyme airplane, so I'm going to throw an airplane in. Uh, we need more... <laughs> we need more... Uh, just to go somewhere better. Okay. One more thing, Ivan Gore says, okay, I'll be the one to mention the center justification. And yeah, we don't really... We tend not to... Again, like the varied, the unusual font, which is an interesting, fun font that we saw in a previous poem today, um, center justifying a poem shows that you don't really read a lot of contemporary poetry or, or even traditional poetry because we only we couldn't really center poems as we were writing until we had a word processor. Um, there's a way with a printing press to do it, but there was sort of no, I mean, you could, but you weren't writing with a printing press. <laughs> and so if you were writing a poem, you were just starting the new line at, at the edge of the page. Um, until we had a word processor. And the truth is, too, there's something that makes reading a lot easier. It's why books with paragraphs work. But when we know as soon as we get to the last word, this place is where we have to dart back with our eye, um, it makes reading a lot easier. It's just there's this ballistic movement your eye makes, this bam, and you can do it so easily and you forget about it. But if we're having to sort of find where, and this is pretty regular, so it doesn't come up too much in this one, but that's the reason why centered poems don't really work as well. They're harder to read, like literally on the page, harder to read. And like we said before, a poem is a regulation of breath, not... Um, not how it looks on the page. We want it to be read easily. And so if you have to find where the next line starts, it feels chunky and clunky and hard to read. So um, so we don't tend to center poems. And it's a sign that you don't read a lot of poems to know that we usually center poems. It's, I mean, it, we've done a few poems in Rattle that are centered, and they can be great, but, um, but, but we don't do that very often. Okay, we got to wrap it up. I got to go. It's been a really fun critique of the week. Everybody, thanks so much for joining me. Um... Uh, you know, looked at a lot of poems. Let me set a no here. We looked at a lot of poems and uh, and that, those sestinas too. So write your sestinas for the 
Rattlecast this week. This week's guest coming up on the Rattlecast is going to be James Cruz. He's got those wonderful anthologies. This is just one of them, The Path to Kindness, Poems of Connection and Joy. But he puts together these great anthologies of poems um, that are really popular and, and really, you know, having positivity within poetry is something that's missing. So it's great to be talking to him about that. He's a great poet, too, in his own right. We'll be talking about his poems, talking about these anthologies, his view of the world. Rattlecast number 236. Monday, March 11th, regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, with your golden sestinas, too, is the prompt lines. Um, that's Rattlecast number 236. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great weekend, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye. <laughs>